Amen. Thank you, Sue. How many of you recognize that song Sue was playing? God will take care of you. And I thought, thank you, Lord, because, you know, last Sunday I couldn't even hardly speak and uh, not doing a whole lot better today, but better. But uh, when she said, God will take care of you, I said, thank you, Lord. Somebody's got to take care of us. <laughs> and God's taking care of us. Thank the Lord. Ten weeks ago, on June the 2nd, 2019, I started a series of messages called The Road to Revival. And those of you that were here hopefully will remember that it began with a message from 2 Chronicles 7.14, where the Bible says, If my people, which are called by my name, shall humble themselves and pray, and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven will forgive their sin and heal their land. You'll remember at the end of that message, I told the congregation, now I have preached that message here before, but I want it to be different this time because I want you to do something about it. And apparently most messages, you know, we don't do anything about. And so I, I made a challenge to the congregation, one that I had never made here before, to uh, come to the altar and pray for revival if you really and truly desired to see revival and the whole congregation came forward in the altar to pray for revival and we I believe with all of my heart that day that moment Bruceville Baptist Church began on the road to revival and I hope you remember a, a couple other challenges were made during that service one was if, if you see the clock strike 7 14 a.m. or 7 14 p.m. to please stop and pray for revival according to 2nd Chronicles 7 14 and I hope many of you took that challenge and are still doing that if not I remind you again pray for revival if you see the clock at 7 14 a.m. 7 14 p.m. pray for revival as we said then, folks, there's no doubt or question about it. We need revival in our nation. We need revival in our state. We need revival in our county. We need revival in our church more, perhaps, than we've ever needed it before. Remember the saying, our only means of survival is revival. Our only means of survival is revival. Please pray for revival. And then a couple of weeks later, we even talked about fasting and praying for revival and challenged the people to fast uh, a meal or two a week, a meal or two a day, to fast for a, a, a full day, or, or to practice some sort of fasting and praying for revival. And again, I hope that some have continued to do that. But as we began, and I hope continue, on the road to revival, there, there are some detours along the way. And today we're beginning a five message series on detours on the road to revival. Detours on the road. There's nothing that Satan would like better than to get you and I on a detour when we're on the road to revival. Uh, a detour will lead you to distress. A detour will lead you to disappointment. A detour will lead you to disenfranchise your relationship with the Lord if you allow the devil to do that. The detours lead to not experiencing what God would have us to experience in the way of revival. There are five detours on the road to revival. We'll take one each week for the next five weeks. They're found in Numbers chapters 13 and 14. In Numbers chapters 13 and 14, we find five detours on the road to revival. This morning, we're going to consider detour number one. Detour number one on the road to revival is the detour of a lack of faith or trust in God. A lack of faith or trust in God. This is illustrated through the names of the spies that were sent out to spy the land. How many of you know that in the Bible, names had very specific meanings? 
You know, in our day and time, people, when they have a child and get ready to name the child, they might just kind of pull a popular name out of the hat, or they might think of some popular movie star, actress, or actor that they like that they might name their child after, or some musician. Or, you know, we get names from mighty strange places someday, seems like, in our day and time. And names seem not to mean much in our day and time, but in the Bible, in the Bible, names had meaning. Names were very important to people in God's Word. And so we're going to look at the names of these and find from those an illustration of a lack of faith or trust in God. The Bible simply says there in Numbers 13, the infired, infallible, inerrant Word of God says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, saying, Send thou men, that they may search the land of Canaan, which I give unto the children of Israel. Of every tribe of their fathers shall you send a man, every one a ruler among them. And Moses, by the commandment of the Lord, sent them from the wilderness of Paran. And by the way, Paran, by definition, means full of caverns. It signifies a dark place, full of caverns. All those men were heads of the children of Israel. And these were their names, of the tribe of Reuben, Shamia, the son of Zachar. Of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Horai. Of the tribe of Judah, Caleb, the son of Jephunneh. Of the tribe of Issachar, Agal, the son of Joseph. <coughs> of the tribe of Ephraim, Oshia, the son of Nun. Of the tribe of Benjamin, Paltai, the son of Raphi. Of the tribe of Zebulun, Gadiel, the son of Sodai. Of the tribe of Joseph, namely of the tribe of Manasseh, Gadai, the son of Susai. Of the tribe of Dan, Amiel, the son of Gamali. Of the tribe of Asher, Sether, the son of Michael. Of the tribe of Naphtali, Nobai, the son of Vophsai. Of the tribe of Gad, Guel, the son of Machai. These are the names of the men which Moses sent to spy out the land. <coughs> and Moses called Oshia, the son of Nun, Jehoshua. By the way, just out of curiosity, you might notice, or you would not notice, none of these names appear anywhere else in the Bible except for the names Caleb and Joshua. They're the only two names that appear anywhere else in the Bible. <coughs> so as we think of a lack of faith or trust in God, we think of the names of these men that were sent out. And by the way, these were significant men. The Bible calls them rulers uh, of the people. That they, were, they were the upper crust uh, of the society of that day. They weren't just run-of-the-mill uh, jacklegs that you might send out to do something. They were important people. But if you notice the first name there in verse 4, the tribe of Reuben, Shamia, the son of Zachar. Now, Shamia, by definition, means famous. Famous. Shamia, I get the picture, is the one that wanted all the attention. He wanted to be famous. He thought fame and fortune were, were more important than anything else in life. If his name was always remembered, <coughs> you know, there's a modern day Christian song that talks about, you know, I, I don't want anything to, to be remembered about me, only Jesus only Jesus to be remembered. But a person like Shamia wanted his name to always be remembered. He wanted to be famous so that people would always recognize his name when his name was brought up. And so, so he was just concerned about himself and, and being famous. So it, it, that, that exhibits a lack of faith or trust in God right there. Then of the tribe of Simeon, Shaphat, the son of Horai. Now, Shaphat literally means judge. Judge. We've all met judge, right? E everything's wrong with everybody else. You know, I'm going to tell you what's wrong with you. I'm going to judge you. I'm, I'm going to tell you what's wrong in your life, but, but nothing's wrong with me. I, I'm the judge. I'm the one that's going to tell you what's going on. You know, and, and so again... Uh, if you're the judge, that kind of leaves God out, doesn't it? <coughs> if you're the judge, if you're the one that's going to judge everybody else, you don't need God. You're a God of your own. So that's Shaphat. 